Hello, um, welcome back. So, 40 ish people in the classroom, so I will get started. And yeah, so in today's class, we will um, officially start talking about some algorithms. And this chapter or this week, the title for it is to get started, right? And I found it's um, the two examples that we will cover today are actually from the textbook. And it's actually very um, um, classical examples of showing how for the same problem, even a simple problem of sorting um, um, a, an input sequences and different algorithms can actually result in quite different performances. Okay, so that is a big uh, problem. I mean, not a big problem, but a big question of uh, describing the performances of, of algorithms um, because there are all kinds of resources that we need to take into consideration. And like the, how fast the algorithm runs and how many, uh, how much uh, memory space um, it will cost. So we will, uh, use these two uh, sorting algorithms um, that we will cover today, uh, or actually this week, as an example to show that um, how the algorithms can be compared in terms of performance. Okay, so I think we will have time to cover the first sorting algorithm, which is uh, in the insurgent sort, and I would recommend you to read the textbook from page 16 to 28 after the lecture today. So because this is the very first um, lecture on uh, introducing the pseudocode conventions, and we will first introduce some concept regarding how to uh, prove the correctness of algorithms. And also, it will be the uh, introduction of the notations of um, describing the uh, running times of an algorithm. Okay, so I guess um, it would be sufficient if we cover the uh, insurgent sort in today's class. Um, so, unless I uh, mentioned that, unless I made a, a, a um, uh, announcements in the canvas, uh, then I think reading the textbook after the class uh, is recommended. But for later on chapters, there are some chapters that I think maybe some uh, reading before the class would also be helpful. But for that case, for those cases, I will send, uh, make some uh, announcements on the canvas. Yeah. So I think we're fine this time. Yeah. Okay, and I also I will also talk about uh, the first assignments that I'm going to release after the lecture on Thursday. There will be a question set released, and also the first programming uh, assignment released. Okay, so for the first program assignment, programming assignments, there will not be uh, too much. Uh, coding um, work, but basically I would like you to have the two sorting algorithms, uh, the insertion sort and emerge sort implemented in Python. So uh, on Thursday, we will also talk a little bit about Python, about uh, the programming environments, about uh, how to use Jupyter Notebooks to submit the assignments. Yeah, so that'll plan for this week. And for today, I will only, I think we can only uh, cover the insurgent sort and spend more time on getting used to the conventions and notations uh, that we will keep using throughout the, uh, the, the whole semester. All right. Okay. So uh, I hope you still have uh, 
remembered that in the uh, our last first day's lecture, uh, when we talk about what an algorithm is, or what algorithms do, we use the um, um, process or a set of procedures that can produce certain types of outputs given certain types of inputs, right? So for sorting algorithms in particular, the inputs for our algorithm uh, is actually a sequence of numbers. Okay? And the outputs is a permutation or reordering of all the original elements in the input, but now in different orders, right? So that's the order satisfy that uh, the algorithms, uh, the, the values, the magnitudes of those uh, elements are, are increasing in an increasing order. That is our uh, default uh, assumption for defining the insertion, uh, defining the sorting problem, okay? So actually we have a, um, uh, so many various types of sorting algorithms and in certain sort is one of them, those um, relatively simple ones to implement. And also they have quite, uh, they're quite intuitive to, to understand and also to easier to, to visualize, okay? So it's quite actually similar to uh, if you ever played poker cards, uh, with multiple players together, right? So you basically want to uh, start with an empty hand. Let's think about how we play the poker cards, right? With um, two or four people sitting together, right? We have our left hand empty, right? And there will be a pile of cards facing down on the table, okay? So usually we would just like take one card from the table at a time and we'll put it into our left hand, right? And usually what we would like to do with the hand or with the card on our hand is to insert each card that we take into the correct position in the hand, right? Basically we want to sort all the cards by the numbers, okay? And during that process, if we already have say 10 cards already on our left hand, then when we are inserting the 11th card, what we need to do is to compare it with each of the cards already in our hand, right? You can see that, I guess that's a, that's a pretty common scene, right? And you have to take that card to be, uh, to be inserted and to scan through all of the cards on, already on your hand, right? Until you find a position that is uh, correct to insert. So I think that this uh, poker cards game pretty much explains um, uh, how the insertion sort algorithm runs. Okay. Uh, if you would like, you can uh, follow this link to see a um, video demonstration, which is uh, what I recorded uh, a couple of slides, a couple of semesters ago. Okay, All right. So let's directly jump into the pseudocode, right? Uh, this is the first time that we uh, read uh, the pseudocode convention, uh, the, the pseudocode used by the textbook, okay? But uh, uh, I think it's uh, um, um, the, the styles of the pseudocode is quite uh, straightforward, okay? So we will not, on this slide, we will not dive into the details, but let's uh, just uh, look at some of those, uh, our arguments and the overall structure of the code, okay? All right, so the procedure's name is called insert and sort, right? And the capital A here between the parentheses is the input, okay? So the input is, um, actually an, an array that has uh, um, n numbers, right? It is to be sorted, okay? And what we notice here, if you look at the first line of the code, it's a for loop, okay? It starts uh, immediately from a for loop. And 
if we look at the range of the for loop, it's not from the first elements, but from the second. Okay, so here there's a little uh, tricky detail about the indexing uh, of elements in an array. Okay, if you are, I guess most of you used um, any uh, programming uh, languages before, like Python, Java, C++. So the typical uh, uh, convention for indexing elements in the sequence uh, is to use zero index as the first for the first element, right? But uh, that is not the case for the pseudocode that we um, used uh, in the slides and in the textbook, okay? Um, maybe it's because that uh, as human beings, we, when we think about problems, like when we try to uh, order the um, objects in the, in the, in the list, you know, items in the list, we usually name the uh, first elements use uh, integer number one rather than zero, okay? But uh, it'll be easier for um, programming languages to use zero index as the first elements. Okay, so that may cause some inconsistency um, between the coding styles of the pseudocode and the Python-based programming assignments. Yeah, but I don't think it's a um, uh, critical issue here um, because uh, it, it, it takes several, you know, rounds of um, uh, tweaking around to uh, um, to increase or uh, decrease the, the loop counters by one uh, if you want to uh, implement the same algorithm in Python as opposed to the pseudocode. Yeah. So anyway, for our pseudocode, throughout basically throughout the whole course, we will uh, stick with the um, one indexing. Um, convention, okay. And another detail here, the a dot lens, that is also something that we mentioned. Um, well, I guess we didn't mention that yet, but uh, this is a typical um, object-oriented programming style, right? We're treating as if that's the, the, the input every a is an object and it has a uh, a attribute, an attribute or a property called length. And this a dot length is at actually an integer number. All right. So that's how the algorithm looks like, right? And overall speaking, this algorithm, it doesn't return anything, right? So it's a sorting algorithm that happens in place, which means the elements in the input array A get swapped around, get rearranged, and there's actually no extra memory allocated, right? We didn't allocate a second array called B, for example, and we didn't copy elements from A to B. So, um, Memory-wise speaking, it's this algorithm is uh, quite efficient. Yeah, so we're gonna step into the details of how each line of the code uh, means and the the, the functions, detailed functions. So it's it's good that you notice that this actually a uh, two-layer nested loop structure we basically have the outer layer, which is a for loop, and we have the loop counter for the for loop as J, right? So J marks the uh, which iteration uh, it is for the for loop. And within the for loop, there is an inner, inner while loop, right? And the loop counter for the while loop is a different variable, which is I. Okay, and before the while loop starts, the i is initialized to j minus one, which is basically one element ahead of j. Okay, um, yeah, let's see 
what would happen if we take an um, um, uh, simple, uh, take a simple input as an example to see the uh, outcomes of running this algorithm. Okay, that's the same um, algorithm, right? Let's just consider an input that has six elements, which is five, two, four, six, and one, three. And I think uh, no matter what kind of algorithms that we are given, the most, e the easiest way to um, have a sense of what task it's accomplishing uh, is to use uh, a uh, sim simple example here. Okay. All right. The animation started. Okay. All right. So we copied the input sequence here five, two, four, six, one, three. And also there are some highlights here. The five is in gray and the two is in black. And the black actually indicates the uh, initial position of J, right? Because our first line of code uh, says that the J will start from two, okay? So that's where the J started. And the, the second loop counts will, um, uh, the, the loop variable, which is I, right? So the initial, the first value for I would be two minus one, which would be one, right? So let's uh, enter the first iteration of the uh, for loop. Then the key would be the current AJ, which is, which has the value two in this case, right? And the third line of code is actually a, uh, a comment. So it explains the function of, of the following code. That's uh, from line four to line eight. Okay. So the line four tells that the initial value of I would be two minus one, which will be one, okay? And the next, it's uh, where the tricky part occurs. It's a while loop, okay? So the while loop says that the loop will not end until either one of these uh, conditions break. So if I is greater than zero, then the while loop satisfied, the condition satisfied. And if the um, I's element is greater than the key, right? Then the while loop should, uh, should uh, keep executing. Okay, so let's look at the first iteration of the while loop because the I is one. So this, let me use a second color. This um, Boolean expression is true, right? And if we look at A1, A1 has the value five. Five is greater than the key because the, 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 the two here is our key. So the two conditions on the while loop also both satisfy. Okay, so that means the uh, body of the while loop will be executed. So what the while loop execute is that it will copy the elements to the right. It will copy the, uh, the elements in AI to the right of it, okay? The values in AI will be copied into the position of A plus one, AI plus one. What is AI? AI is the value five, right? And what is AI plus one? AI plus one is where our current value two is at, right? So it means that we will copy the five into the element where it's currently uh, two, right? So this is indicated by this uh, gray arrow here. Okay, so that while loop will execute, uh, the, the, the body of the while loop will ex execute once, okay? And after AI is copied to AI plus one, the I will uh, decrement by one, which means 
it will decrease from the old value one to zero. Okay, then let's consider the next iteration of the while loop. Let's see, i equals zero now. So the if the, the, the first Boolean expression of the while loop doesn't satisfy. Zero is not strictly greater than zero. So the second iteration of the while loop will not be executed, okay? So the while loop will exit or abort or quit with the values of i equals zero, okay? And let's see the last line of the code, which is a i plus one equals p. Okay, remember we, we store the old value of uh, aj into the variable called key because the aj is now overwritten by, uh, by the, uh, the, the, the previous a1, right? So now the, we will need to copy the key into the uh, position where it is a1. Okay. And that is what uh, occurs within the first iteration of the for loop. Okay, remember that's just a, remember that's just a one iteration of the for loop. And the for loop will be uh, executed for uh, how many times? We have six uh, elements and from J from two to six, that's four times. So let's look at the next iteration, right? You can see the difference here from the uh, elements. Compare the uh, step A and step B, right? The the A is with uh, the A is uh, the, the A one is swapped to the position of A two, and the two is inserted to the um, previous. Um, to, to the to the position of a1 right all right so maybe we can make some um, analogies to the poker card playing games okay because we have uh, three different colors here uh, maybe you can think of the number in gray backgrounds for step a the number five will be the card on your left hand. And you are taking one card from the table, which is indicated by the dark background, the black background, which is a two, right? And because the two is smaller than five, so you need to put it to the left of A5, okay? So that's accomplished by the while loop, right? Use the while loop, you basically compare the, the, the key card, which is two here, and you compare all the cards on the left hand. And since you only have one card, you just compare the key card with your uh, card on the hand and insert it to the left, right? Um, yeah, that's the... Yeah, so the increment aligned at line um, eight is necessary. Um, basically due to the fact that at line seven, each time we um, uh, decrement, uh, each time we um, uh, made a comparison between uh, the AI and the key, we have to move I to the left, right? Otherwise we, we can't uh, compare the key with the next available card. It's our hand, right? And uh, even for J, oh yes, yes. Uh, one uh, thing that's hidden here, hidden by the for loop, you see the the J, the for loop implicitly uh, contains an incrementation for uh, the loop counter J, right? The J will basically iterates from two to three to four, five, six, until the, uh, until the maximum value, which is a dollar lens. Okay. 
So that's for the several questions. Let me look at the chat. What's the reason we stick with one indexing convention other than starting at zero? So uh, there's no particular reason for why we are doing this. And if it's actually quite easy, we can uh, um, convert this code to zero indexing. Like we can just let the J start from one to uh, a dot lens minus one. Okay, that makes more sense from a practical programming language perspective. But I guess the reason for the textbook to use the one indexing is that it may be closer to the way how um, we, uh, you know, index uh, items or objects for um, real life sequences, right? We would say that the head of the sequence is the first rather than saying that this is the, the zeros, right, elements. Um, does line two overwrite, correct? Yeah, because the J uh, changes. Uh, let me read it again. Does the, Line two, not overwrite, get excluded after line eight. We assign the key to the second element. So key is just the current element that we are reading. Yes, so I think Tyler is correct. The key is just the current element that we are uh, inserting into the correct position of the array. Yeah. I don't think I fully understand the comments from Yash. Uh, does line two not overwrite get executed after line eight? The keys, the, the, the variable key will get overwritten in the second, in the next iteration of the for loop. Yeah. So now let's look at the next uh, for loop iteration, which is J equals three, right? So this time the J starts with three and our key is a different value now, right? The previous key is the number two. And now the key with the dark uh, background is the number four, right? So this time we are, like we have two cards in our left hand, which is number two and number five in the gray color. And the next card that we take from the table is the number four. Okay, so now we need to decide at which position we need to insert the number four into the existing two cards, right? Either before two or between two and five, or just leave it uh, after five. Okay, so that'll be decided by the uh, while loop. Okay, so the basically uh, just let's follow the code. J equals three means that the I would equal two, right? Two is greater than zero. And let's look at A2. A2 is five, five is greater than a key, right? Five is greater than the key, which is four. So the, uh, the uh, five, number five will be copied into the element to the right, right? The A2 will be copied to A3 and I will uh, uh, decrease by one. And let's look at the next iteration. The next iteration of the while loop will be I equals one. Right, it's still greater than zero, but if you compare the A1 with the key, A1 is just two, right? Two is not greater than the four, right? Which means the while loop should, the condition of the while loop actually breaks. So the second iteration of the while loop should not be executed, right? So the black arrows only stops here. Right, and the 
key will be copied to uh, I plus one, which is A2 here. All right, so that's uh, a next uh, second iteration of the for loop. Right, we have more iterations to go through. The third iteration, right? This time, let's go uh, go through it quicker. Okay, j equals four, right? And i will be initialized to three, right? And this is a tricky iteration because we can notice that i will be three, right? And when we look at the um, um, elements A3, which is five. Five is smaller than six, which means there's no need to compare the, the, the target number, the, the key number with all the elements behind uh, before, right? Because five is already the greatest, it's already, uh, smaller than six, so there's no need to compare six with uh, all the elements before it, right? So we can uh, directly, uh, uh, so the, the last assignment, the, the last line of code will still be executed, but it's just assign the key value to the element itself. Uh, okay, so Yash, the question for from you is, how does J get incremented? Okay, so that, uh, yeah, that is the uh, implicit uh, mechanism of for loop. So it's not written into any line of those code because we assume that the for loop will increase the loop counter J each time after the uh, the whole body of the whole body of the for loops get executed. That's correct. So Stephen, that's correct. If we write a while loop, then we have to manually handle the loop counters. Yeah. And I think it's quite easy to rewrite. So I see an interesting question. So why do we start at the second elements? That's a, uh, that's a good question. So if let's imagine if we start with the first elements, then actually the, 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 the moments that we take the first elements, there's actually no need to insert to anywhere. Okay, so it's like your empty left hand. When, when we just start playing the game, we have our left hand empty. And the first card that we take, we can simply put it in our hand, right? We don't need to compare it with any other hand, uh, card because there's no other cards in our left hand. So it's only the second card that we take from the table, then we need to compare it with our existing card in our hand. Yeah. All right, we had a really nice questions and discussions here. Okay, so let's simply um, follow the code and execute the next uh, iteration of the for loop, j equals y. Well, we can see that for this iteration, there gotta be a lot of comparisons, right? Because the key is a very small value, right? And it will be, uh, when the number one, when, when the key is compared to all the elements before it, basically all the while loop conditions satisfy, right? So the six will be copied to the right. The number five will all be also copied to the right. Four will also copy to the right. And so is two. And when the while loop ends, the i will be zero. And the key will be copied to a zero plus one, which is a one, okay? Which means after compare 
this card, number one card, with all, all, all of the cards available on our left hand, we have to insert it at the very beginning. Okay. And lastly, for the last element three, we will make uh, several steps of uh, copying and then find the correct position and insert three into that uh, correct position. And that's it. That's the complete um, rundown of the insert and sort algorithm using a, uh, a simple input as an example. Okay, no problem. Uh, there's a question explain how the values are swept. I understand that my greater value is copied to the right, but how does the lower value get swept? Okay. All right, so um, it's not technically a swap. Okay, because there's no, uh, it's, it's just a copy from uh, I to I plus one, right? I plus one is to the right of AI. So it's just to copy the uh, um, elements to the, uh, to the elements right next to it, right? So let's take the iteration D for example. Uh, let me read a question completely. Having the entire array be filled with fives. Okay. okay. So for the iteration D as an example, um, our key value would be uh, A of J, which is one. Okay. So the number here, the number one here will be the key value, right? And the I will start with uh, four, right? It's the i is initialized to j minus one, and we know that j is five, right? So i starts with four. So, um, because a four, which is which has a value of six, it's greater than the key, right? We will copy the a four to a five, right? Right, A5 was originally one, but after we copying A4 to A5, then A5 would become six, right? So after this copy is done, the A4 is still six, it remains six because we didn't change it yet. We simply decrement the loop counter I, right? So the loop counter decreases by one, which becomes three, right? And we will check the loop condition again, right? To see that the i is still greater than zero and the ai, is, which is now the number five, is also greater than the key, which is our one, right? The key never changed, okay? So that means for the i equal three, the while loop still uh, holds, and we need to copy the a three to a four, which means we need to copy the number five to six. So now this time, the six will become five, right? And afterwards, the 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 the, the value of a a three doesn't change; it's still five. Okay, so uh, this procedure will keep running right into the next uh, while loop, which copies the five, uh, which copies the four to five, right? And it still remains four, and next uh, two to four, right? And two, the, the A1 will be two. So after the while loop is done for this uh, particular iteration, the uh, we have to run the line eight, which copies the uh, key elements to the first uh, to the first uh, uh, element. Yeah, 
Yeah, Tyler summarized it correctly, I think. Yeah. So it basically pushes all the small, uh, all the, all the um, big elements that's greater than the key, one to the right, right? We pushes all the elements that's greater than the key to the right. And then we stop at a point where the key is still a greater value, right? And we will insert the key at the, at the right position. Okay. Yeah, uh, so I think it'll be really helpful if you can uh, read the code on the textbook and uh, go through the uh, explanations and also the slides uh, several times. And you can work on a paper with a different example, right? You change the numbers a little bit and to see if you have the each step correctly, uh, um, correctly figured out or correctly uh, visualized. All right. Um, that's a stepwise analysis uh, for the insert and sort. Ooh, okay. Yeah. So uh, we can make a pretty nice analogy to a poker card. Uh, for example, the the loop counter J it indicates or the, the current card to be inserted, which is the one we just took from the table, right? And everything before J, the elements from the first one to the J minus one's card, they are the uh, currently sorted cards, right? If you look at the previous slide, the green, the gray cards, they are the currently sorted cards, right? So all we need to do is to uh, find the, find the right position to insert the key, okay? And the elements from J plus one to N are the remaining pile of cards on the table. Yeah. So next, um, the textbook introduced a concept called loop invariance. Okay, so I think this is a bit uh, abstract uh, concept. So, uh, I want, I will not go to go into the details of how uh, we should prove that the loop invariance holds for in certain sort. So basically the loop invariance here is a property about the, uh, uh, about the input data or the input uh, sequence for the in certain sort. This property says that all the elements from the first one to the J minus one elements are those that originally exist in position one through J minus one, but now they are in sorted order. Okay, so this is a uh, property or a statement. And we can use this property or statement to check the correctness of the insertion sort, okay. So because in our previous slide, we have run experiments, run the algorithm through a complete example, which shows that it is correct, right? But that's just one example. Uh, if we want to like uh, rigorously, more rigorously prove that the insertion sort always work, then what we would like to, we, we, we will need to use something like uh, mathematical induction to predict that uh, the, the algorithm indeed both true for uh, all kinds of inputs, okay? And the loop invariant will be one of the such uh, techniques to help prove the correctness of elements. But I will not go into the details. I don't think we need to, uh, it's not required for uh, uh, understand the insertion sort at this point. So I, for the next uh, three or four slides, I marked the optional, um, 
keywords here. So I think if you're interested, you can check out the, uh, the slide later. And also you can read well, while you go through the, uh, the textbooks, there will be more detailed explanations about what a loop invariant is. Okay, let me skip these slides. Yeah, so uh, in one sentence, the purpose of having a loop invariant is to prove the correctness of uh, the algorithm in uh, for more general cases. Okay. Yeah, but for now, let's uh, look at the pseudocode conventions. Okay. This is something we will uh, uh, keep using for the whole course. And we have just gone through an algorithm ourselves, right? Yeah, let's look at the code again. So first of all, uh, it looks like these code are pretty much similar to the Python code we uh, will write. So there's no uh, begin or end keywords. There's no curly brackets. We just use indentions to indicate the the scope of a for loop or the scope of a of a function or uh, procedures, right? And in this example, we have um, encountered two loop structures, which is the for loop and the while loop. And the textbook introduce a third type, which is repeat until. Okay, which is kind of similar to the do while loop in C language, but it's not that common. And I didn't see myself a lot throughout the textbook that uh, uh, the repeat until uh, structure is used uh, to implement loops. So I think for most of the algorithms described, we, uh, the, the for loop and the while loop will be uh, sufficient. Okay. Some uh, properties about the loop counters, right? Uh, the variable J and the I, they are the loop counters. So we assume that the loop counters will uh, retain their values after the loop is done. Okay. So that means uh the j's will keep the last value after the loop uh for loop breaks for example and immediately after the loop the loop counters value is the value that first exceeds the loop bound okay so what what does that mean if you look at the example here when the loop the outer for loop um terminates we know that the range of the j will be two to a dot length, right? So the condition for the loop to uh, break is that the loop counter breaks, uh, uh, exceeds the loop uh, boundary, right? So after the loop, the for loop ends, the, actually the loop counter will be uh, one plus the length of a. Yeah, so that's a, a little piece of detail about the loop counters. Yes, that's correct. Uh, access arrays, yeah. So the, the brackets, the square brackets uh, access convention is uh, pretty typical. Uh, um, programming style, like we can put a number within the square brackets to access certain uh, elements, right? And also I mentioned before that the a dot lens is a typical object oriented uh, programming language style. All right, so that's some sort of um, pseudocode conventions. And there's some more advanced um, content here about arguments uh, parsing. Um, I think it's something uh, 
interesting to, to learn about. Um, but as more algorithms, as we go through in this course, uh, this is something that we'll get uh, 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 much more familiar with, okay? So, but uh, it's uh, interesting to, to have a, a over, overview uh, knowledge about it. So the arguments here in our pseudocode convention will be passed by value, okay? Which means the procedure um, um, will receive its own copy of all the elements, okay? So if the, assign, if the procedure being called uh, assigns a new value to the arguments, then the change will not be seen by the caller, okay? But this doesn't, uh, actually this property doesn't, it is not quite uh, oftenly um, uh, used uh, throughout the algorithms that we're gonna cover, but it's more of like a programming, uh, programming language uh, property. Uh, the next property is more, um, more important. It says if the objects are passed, in our case, the inputs is an object, is a array object. So when the object is passed, the pointer to the object is copied, okay? And that means we can directly change, we can directly change the values of the elements in that uh, array, okay, because A is kind of a pointer and we can directly change the uh, elements of the array, even if we are in a, in a procedure, we're in a function call, right? So um, that also makes the in-place operation uh, possible, okay, which means we don't need to allocate a new piece of memory to store the elements in, uh, in the inputs, uh, in the inputs array. Okay, that is, uh, those details are more of a concern when we have uh, a large size uh, in the inputs. And in our practices, uh, in our assignments, um, because our implementation for in certain sort and, uh, and, um, and the, the later, the, the merge sort, we, don't actually uh, rely on the in place uh, operations a lot. So it's okay that we allocate some new uh, memory space to store the newly sorted algorithms. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so the argument passed by value, which basically means that if we, uh, pass X as an argument. And in the, in the, in the callee function, in the function being called, if we made such a assignments, then this change will not be visible to the caller. It will not affect the, the function that caused this procedure. But if we modify the properties of the elements, however, this, this change will be visible, yeah. Yeah, so I think we will have a better sense of what this value, what, what this argument passed by value means later on when we have uh, C algorithms like uh, graph algorithms that change the properties of objects directly. Okay. And example two, which shows, which is exactly the example of insertion sort, which means that the arrays, when the arrays are passed, they are passed by pointers. So all the individual elements are actually visible to the caller procedure. We can directly change the elements in the sub procedure. And this change will be uh, 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 reflected to the upper level caller function. Okay, and these mechanism is maybe a little bit different from the Python programming language. If you are interested, you can refer to the, um, the, the documents here to see uh, how arguments are passing are handled in Python. Yeah, which may be potentially useful because our assignments will be in Python language. Okay. All right, so, 
what we would like to proceed on next is uh, actually an important step. We have um, implemented um, the insert and sort code. And we know it's a, a kind of correct, although we didn't prove it, right? But if we want, we can prove it that actually this implementation of uh, insert and sort actually is a correct one. It works on uh, works for basically all kinds of inputs. And another thing, another aspect of an algorithm that we care uh, about is how efficient that algorithm is, which means how fast it runs, right? So when we talk about efficiencies, we actually have a lot of in mind, like not just uh, the running time, but also sometimes the memory usage, the communication bandwidth and hardware and so on. And, but usually speaking, the computation time is the most important property or the most important metric that we use to measure the uh, performance or the efficiency of an algorithm, okay? So in order to do a fair comparison, we will assume that we are running the algorithm on the simple computer with one processor. There's no multi-threading, multi-processing. There's on uh, a random access machine uh, memory model, right? And which means all the instructions are executed one after another sequentially. There's no concurrency operations. There's no parallel computing, okay? And also we would assume that they're a common set of primitive instructions. So what is a primitive instructions? Like the adding, subtracting, multiply, dividing, remainder, right? And the load store copy, which is basically behind the assignment statements, okay? The assigning statements, when we copy something to the other, these are the primitive instructions. And also the if, else, subroutine calls or returns, okay? So all of this listed here, the primitive instructions listed here, we would assume that they take a constant amount of time, okay? So we made these assumptions really simplistic because we want to rule out the factors, those maybe those machine dependent factors uh, before we analyze the, uh, the, the real performance of algorithms. All right, so all these said, let's now try to um, analyze the uh, efficiency of the insertion sort, right? Because this is a, a sorting algorithm. And of course, the time taken by a sorting algorithm depends on the length of the input, right? Longer time, of course, will be needed if we sort longer input arrays, okay? So that's one factor that affects the running time. And the secondly, <clears throat> the quality of the inputs also matters, right? Although we, we seldom have this information, but if an algorithm, if an input is already nearly sorted, then it should take shorter time, right? So these two factors will affect how we analyze the efficiency of a sorting algorithm, okay? And our general consumption assumption is that the time needed or the time taken by a sorting algorithm grows with the size of the inputs, okay? We believe that this is a general uh, effect that's general tr generally true, okay? So that means we can describe the running time of an algorithm as a function of the input size, okay? Here we said a function, but we don't know what type of function it is, right? And we know that some functions grows faster than the others, okay? If you think about a linear function, which is basically just a linear line versus a quadratic function, right? Say n square, then of course, the curve of the n square grows much faster than the linear function, right? But anyway, we can use a function to describe 
uh, the running time of the algorithm, right? If the function, the input to that function is the is the size of the input. Okay. All right. So now let's uh, <clears throat> further define the running fun uh, running time and the input size uh, more carefully. Okay. So because when we talk about the size, actually we can refer to the number of items or the number of bits, right? And I think more commonly, we would like to use the number of items in the inputs. Okay, so that is the case for our analysis here. And for running time, okay? So this is a trickier concept. So what would be the, the actual running time of the algorithm, right? Because if we, if we measure it in seconds, then it's probably, you know, depends on the hardwares, right? So if we, if we talk about um, absolute, absolute amount of time, then it's, uh, it's a quantity that always changes, that always depends on the, con uh, on the conditions. So uh, we usually would use the number of primitive instructions or steps executed. So the primitive instructions include the, those that we have mentioned in the previous slide, right? Remember the, the arithmetic uh, instructions, movement, control, and so on. So all those instructions that takes constant amount of time, we would say that they are the, um, uh, primitive instructions, and they are the uh, the units or the steps that we use to measure the running time. Okay, and we assume that the step size is machine uh, independent. Okay, so we don't consider the differences between machines. All right, so much conditions we have laid out. Right, let's uh, uh, look at how we can analyze the running time of an insurgent sort, okay? We will assume that the each line, uh, each execution of each line will takes that amount of time, right? We have eight lines of code in the insurgent sort, and we assume that the i's line takes c i time, okay? And that's one execution. Okay, so that's an, an assumption we can uh, place, right? And also, each line, that's a, we should notice that each line of code is executed for a certain number of times, right? And this number of times is actually an integer numbers. And we know that this quantity varies across lines. Some lines are only executed once, for example, and some lines are executed for multiple times, right? Depending on uh, the number of the inputs. So let's going back to the code. We have eight lines of code. And if we first assign a constant to each line, and that constant is the amount of time, maybe in seconds or in number of steps, right? But anyway, there are constants, right? To execute each line once, okay? And also we need to determine how many times each line is actually executed. All right. Let's do this one by one. So the for loop, the range of the for loop goes from two to a dot length and assume that a dot length equals n, then the for loop will be executed from two to n, right? And remind, uh, we need to, Remind that after the last iteration, the, the J will also increment by one, right? So 
the total number of times for the for loop is actually n, okay, not n minus one, although it's a it's a it's a very small difference, okay. <clears throat> and for the bodies, let's look inside look inside the for loop. Each line of the code inside the body of the for loop actually runs n minus one times, right? Because j ranges from two to n, right? And from two to three to four to n, that's n minus one numbers, okay? So each line of the code within the for loop body has will be executed for n minus one times. And I leave three lines of code empty here because this is the special part. There is another while loop here, right? And we don't know how many times each line of code within the while loop has, will be executed, right? We don't know that. So we need to figure out how many times the while loops, the while statements will be executed, okay? Yeah, so it's actually also straightforward uh, uh, step because we don't know it. We will simply assume that the while loop is tested. The while loop test is executed for t super uh, subscript j times, right? Because we don't know it. And this quantity may vary from J to J. Different J's means different T of J, right? So this T super, uh, subscript J will be a different value uh, in different J's, okay? So this is a unknown variable, but we can put it in our, in our um, equation, right? So the total number of times will be the summation from i equals two to i equals n, and we sum up t of j's. Okay. And we, if we replace this um, um, equations, substitute these equations with, with the question marks in the previous slide, then we will have this number of times Right, so there's one thing that I would like to emphasize here, and you may also notice that. You see, we assume that the while test, the while condition test statement is executed t j times, and the body of the while loop is actually t minus one times. And this is for the same reason as this difference here. The for loops has been executed by n times while the body of it is executed n minus times, right? Because the test statements of the loop always get one more times executed because we need to decide whether we need to break the loop condition or not, right? Okay, so that's uh, how we define the costs and the number of times, but we are not done yet. What's next, right? We have to do what? We have to sum up all those costs to compute the total running time. If we use the function capital T of N to indicate the total running time of the insertion sort, then it should be the summation of running times for each statement, okay? And because each statement has been executed n times, then the total cost for each statement will be ci times n, right? And we have that many statements. So the t of n for the insertion sort would be the summation of the first product C1 times N, second product C2 times N minus one, third, which is zero, fourth C4 times N minus one, 
fifths, special case, C5 times the summation, C6, C7, C8. Okay. So that is a big equation. And luckily, we can do some simplification based on this equation. Right. Even for inputs of a fixed size, the running time may depend on which input is given. Okay, so we have to analyze the best case. Right? We don't know what Tj is, right? The different values of Tj would affect how we compute those terms. Okay, let's assume, let's first analyze the best case we will have. Right. And it's actually quite um, straightforward because if we analyze the wild loop condition, we will find that if the AI is smaller, is equal to or smaller than the keys, then the wild loop will break, right? Without, without the body being uh, executed, right? As long as all the elements AI is greater than key. If, if this condition doesn't satisfy, if all the elements before AJ, right, is smaller than the key, then the while loop basically doesn't execute at all. That is our, the best case for the algorithm, right? So that means the TJ will be one. The while loop only has to be, only needs to be tested once. Right? And the body will not be executed. So if we substitute Tj equals one into our previous either, uh, equation, we'll have a much simplified equation like this. Right? We can combine all those linear terms right, into this linear form, which we can simply rewrite into A times N plus B. Okay? And this is a typical linear function, okay? So we can say that for the best case, the T of N is a linear function, okay? But that's only the best case because the best case is very rare. You see, in order to obtain this best case uh, running time efficiency, we have to make sure that all the elements before the key are smaller than it. That's basically, an algorithm that's already sorted, right? So this best case is not representative to uh, measure the insertion sort at all, right? We have to um, uh, consider a more um, general case. We have two minutes left. I think we can finish this slide, okay? So for a sorting problem, intuitively we can say that the worst case is the case that all the input elements are in the reverse sorted order, right? That is the most terrible cases for your sorting algorithms. So if that is the case, then it means that we have to compare the key with all the elements that's above it, that's before it, right? We, we, when, we, when we have a, uh, taken a card from the table, if it's smaller than all the, um, all the cards in our hand before it, then we have to basically compare it to all the cards, okay? So, that is a case where the Tj is J actually, right? For J equals two, we have to compare the card with uh, one card, we'll compare the target card with one card. When J equals three, we have to compare it with two cards and so on, okay? So that'll make the summation term quite big. You see, the summation of these uh, this becomes a arithmetic series, right? With sum from two to n can be uh, uh, can be computed using this formula, and the summation of j minus one is actually this formula, right? These are the summation of arithmetic uh, series. So if we substitute these two uh, terms back to the formula, 
actually the running time for the so insurgent swords is actually becomes a uh, quadratic function that likes this. Okay. And in general, speaking, the quadratic function grows much, much faster than the linear function, right? So that is the worst case for the insurgent sort. And we have reached 60, uh, 75 minutes today, and we will leave the analysis to our Thursday's class, okay? So on Thursday, we will cover the rest part of the insurgent sorts and the, and the merge sort as well. Yeah, that's correct. The, the, the quadratic term comes from here, the summation of the while loop, right? The while loop, each while loop Takes, uh, takes j times. And if we sum up j equals two to n, the result will be like this, which is a very, very large quadratic term. Okay. But that is the worst case because only under the worst case, all, all the while loops will be executed fully. And in the average case, we don't, we don't, we don't have that much, but actually we, we didn't do uh, a lot better. We, we will see. We will see that in an, in our next slides, in our next uh, lecture. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you, and I will see you again on Thursday. Hey, Professor. Do you know when our uh, first like assignment or something will be out on Canvas? Yeah, I will release the first assignment on Thursday, and it will be. Uh, I haven't decided the due date yet. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. And then are we expected to like know um, like that worst case scenario for the the running time, like always with like all these other like constants and stuff, or just like O of n squared? Uh, basically for in certain sort, it will be O n squared for okay, average for average. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, thank you. I will stop the recording right now. Hello. Uh, hello, Professor. Yes. Yes. Um, do we have a TA for this class? Yes, we do. We do. Oh, okay. Great. Yeah. You can send uh, questions and I can uh, make an announcement about the context of our TA. Oh, oh you're going to make an announcement about that? Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. All right, thank you. Thank you.